right. Um, we've uh, had a wonderful presentation for Bob Wander. <coughs> In just a minute or two, we're going to have a presentation by Lou that will help us learn more about badges and records, and some of the changes, help us be prepared. Oh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and co-conspirator, Lou Chenard. <laughs> hold your applause, hold your applause. <laughs> so, uh, this was going to be a refresher, but it sounds like it needs to be a tutorial based on Bob's presentation. But, um, so what, what I'm doing is, I'm going to take you through you, this uh, presentation has evolved. It's, I'm going to go through badges and records fairly quickly, but there have been some major changes this year into the rules. And so I, I, I know that I wish Leon were here because I think he tried to set a record and missed it by 60 feet under the old rules. Under the new rules, it would be correct. It would be allowed. So um, well, I'll go through this fairly quickly and um, then open it up for questions. Okay? Or, sorry, if you have a question, just raise your hand. So, why do we keep talking about badges and records at these camps? One, they're building blocks. You get your pilot's license. I got my private and I thought, yay, the FAA says I'm a good pilot. No, the FAA said, you now have a license to learn how to be a good pilot for the rest of your life. And the building block, the badges are building blocks that other people have built for us to, to become better pilots. Um, and then why do you want to look at state records? Well, the glory, the money, the groupies. Not really, but, but uh, it's, a, it's a big deal to set a state record. Um, you know, uh, Daryl took his AC5 a couple years ago, two years ago? Three. Anyway, it's this fantastic 300k flight, 300, 500, 300k flight, and uh, you know, 30, 30 to one, 32 to one glider. So, um, and got a bunch of state records, some of which broke ones that I had set. But I've set them when there was nobody who had set a record. So I claimed a 22 mile flight state record. Um, <laughs> the one thing, the one thing I wanted, I was encouraged to do that, by the way. Um, the one thing I do want to stress about badges and records is you have to do the homework. You have to understand what you're trying to do, what the rules are. There's lots of people to help you, but you're really responsible for this. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't take a lot, but it's just like planning your flight before you get to the airport I talked about yesterday. Uh, the more you know what you're trying to accomplish, uh, bronze badge, for instance, has a list of requirements. So you come to the airport to work with an instructor and say, I want to do this, this, and this. You don't want to walk into the instructor and say, hey, I want to get my bronze badge. What do I need to do? And, and then start flipping through your logbook. Uh, the SSA has created badges. A, the A badge I love. If you survive your solar flight, they give you a pin. Um, and, and, and I mean, your instructor goes, the one who signed you off gives you a pin and, you know, go forth. Uh, the B badge uh, is an hour and a half, a half hour, 30 minute thermaling flight. So this is your first chance to show that you can stay up. And then the C badge and the bronze badge have more requirements. Um, but these are all starting to build you. Once you get A means you survived your solo. B means you might have a clue on how to thermal. C and bronze are starting to move you into being able to safely fly cross country. And the, they get progressively harder, progressively more requirements, progressively more hour requirements. But the key is when you get your bronze badge, the first time you're on a cross country flight and you have to put it down in a farmer's field, you've kind of been there, done that with the skill sets. Uh, the FAI badges, these are FAI now. The SSA administers the other ones, and SSA instructors give you those badges. Now the FAI comes in. Um, I've got silver, gold, and diamond, and then distance diplomas. State record classes, there's a whole bunch of them. <coughs> and so there's lots of, lots of things to chase. Um, the one thing that did happen a number of years ago that people just still don't understand is it used to have separate categories for motor glider and, and regular. There's no motor glider or straight glider anymore. It's just one class. 
So um, if you have a self-launching ASH31MI, congratulations, uh, <laughs> you, you, you compete again in the open class against anybody else, motor or not. And state records, you've got state records for distance, altitude, and speed. Um, a lot of speed records for states are just done accidentally. You did the other flight, and you require this, you, you apply for the speed, and you get it. Um, but there are some people, I, I was out in Utah with a guy, and that's all he likes is speed. And he goes and he figures out, if I start over this mountain, I will have the, fast, the best line of mountains to, to fly. And this guy is from Poland, and he, he set some serious records. Okay, so FAI badges. Two things to understand. The requirements are international. A glider pilot in Poland is doing the same badge requirements as we are. Um, it requires paperwork submitted to the FAI awards coordinator. We call him the badge dude. Its name is Roland Hasness. Roland is a great guy. And by the way, he's gone through this presentation twice. Every year I do this, I send it to him and say, do you mind looking at it? Boy, within a day he's back to me and he says, hey, I'd make this change, I'd make this change. Oh, you didn't understand? There, when we, I started this program, presentation this time, I wrote him and said, hey, I really need to be clear about the changes. And he sent me a document. He also published it in the Soaring Magazine. But I, he sent me a document and said, these are the changes, and I tried to incorporate that. Um, one of the interesting changes about FAI badges is they can now be done electronically, including signatures. And so what you do is, is you just get an email chain going, and I'll, I'll show that a little later. But uh, the, if you're doing state records, you still have to have all the signatures. If you're doing FAI badges, it can be done all done electronically. It does require an official observer. We'll talk about that. By the way, going back, the official observer is where people make a mistake because they get their flight done and said, I had a great flight. Will you be my official observer? And every, there's a number of people in here that I've helped with badge applications and, and been their official observer. But if you come to me and ask me to be your official observer after the fact, I have trouble with that because I need to see your flight recorder, I need to see your setup, I need to kind of know what you're doing. Um, it does require an IGC approved flight recorder. Yes, Roy. Now, on some of them, you don't need to declare ahead of time. No. But you need to have your observer work. Right. So if you think you're going to go and set an altitude record, you need to talk to somebody beforehand and say, would you be my official observer? Everybody will say, sure, go fly. And you, you, you pull the information out of the recorder, but uh, yes. Uh, again, go back to that slide. You're kind of in charge. So if you're planning to do a silver distance flight tomorrow, Nick, um, <laughs> uh, it's going to be, tomorrow's going to be a good day. Uh, yeah. But uh, if you're planning on doing that, you know, I'd be talking about who's going to be my official observer, who's going to help me with paperwork afterwards, who's going to make sure I'm set up with a flight recorder, does, does the club flight recorder, is it charged up, all that good stuff. And if you really want some exciting reading, download IGC Sporting Code Section 3. It's got all the details in there. And I will say this, I did do the Sporting Code years ago, I read it, and I kept asking Rollin questions. And he kept sending me back excerpts from the sporting code. And it's right there. I had read it, but it just didn't click that that's the answer to my question. Yes, sir. Will you know that just for a moment? It changes surprisingly frequently. It's, lately, it's been every 18 months, there's been a significant change. It, is, it doesn't stay the same for years at a time. That's right. So get the current section three. Right. Before you plan your assault on badges or records. And by the way, under the SSA, under achievements, I think they've got a link to it. You get a link to the PDF. Okay, so state records. It's pretty much the same thing. Requires paperwork submitted to the state record keeper, who is Paul Esser from Red Wing Soaring. And now, new and improved this year, we have Dick Andrews, our own Dick Andrews. <laughs> To help out. Um, so, uh, the nurse who actually does the work. 
Pam. So the only difference between this is uh, if you do an estate record, you got to have all the other things we had before, but you got to mail in the documents. They actually do have to be hand signed. Um, so requires an official observer, requires an IGC approved flight recorder, and your official observer. Who it can be an official observer? SSA member B badge. Remember, B badge is a guy who's a woman who's thermal for 30 minutes, right? Um, and knowledge of the rules. That's what bounces people out. If you really don't understand the rules and you, somebody asks you to be the official observer, it's going to be incumbent on you to learn the rules. Um, that's not hard, but, but the key is you're expected when you sign something, uh, you're expected to know the rules. I screwed up two years ago. I was a, um, an official observer for a guy's 500 kilometer flight and I didn't understand the rules. He didn't understand the rules. I thought, by the way, I thought I understood the rules because I was using the same rules as I did when I did my 300K for gold badge and I signed off on it and it got bounced. And had we known the rules, it would have been done differently. Uh, so the official observer has to work with you afterwards to review all your claims and documentation and must sign the SSA award worksheet. We'll talk about that in a second. So, an SSA, there are two documents you have to do, an SSA award application and a badge and record worksheet. I'm going to show you one of those. One of the feedbacks we got from last year is please show me what that thing looks like. And I've got that in a second. An electronic copy of your GPS file, your flight recorder calibration certificate. There's almost always some kind of an altitude requirement. And so you have your flight recorder that says, your flight recorder will say I'm at 10,000 feet and done, being done in a pressure chamber, uh, it will say your actual altitude is 900, 9,050 feet and you need to show that and sometimes do a supporting calculation. Paul, do you know anybody who might be able to calibrate a flight recorder? <laughs> He's your man. So other documentation. If you're doing a distance or a goal claim, sometimes you have to do a calculation showing that your altitude loss is less than 1,000 feet. If it's no question, in, in one of my cases I finished higher than I started, um, then it's no question you don't have to do the calibration. If it's close, you do have to do the calibration. Um, if you're doing a polygon, with a number of turns, you're up to, allowed up to three turn points, a start, finish, and three turn points on some. It sometimes helps to do an Excel spreadsheet that supports that. That has probably been supplemented or supplanted in the last couple of years by CU. They're using CU to do all badge claims. If you go and put your flight into CU, it will tell you which badge claims it qualifies for. Um, but still, it's, sometimes that's a good idea. It also makes sure you get your GPS coordinates correctly. Um, this, is, this is what I was talking about of the calculation for your real, real altitudes. So let's look at a diamond goal application. Okay, hang on one second. <coughs> so uh, the background is I was flying out in Utah and at Parowan, sorry. I was flying on in Parowan and I got off tow and at Parowan they take you up, you're about 1,500 feet above the airport but you're 500 feet above the rocks because they fly you into the mountains and I fell out and I was upset and I was really not happy and because um, you go all that way and yeah, everybody else is staying up but I couldn't stay up and, and so instead of licking my, my wounds, uh, sorry, I was licking my wounds and I feeling sorry for myself and I decided I didn't want to fly anymore that day which was a smart idea. Um, took my wife out to lunch, went back to my hotel room and said let's plan a flight for tomorrow. And I, I, I wanted to do a diamond goal which is a 300 kilometer declared flight where you land back at the airport you took off at. And I tried to figure out what might work. I have no idea what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. 
but might as well plan it. It required me to create a, a waypoint, and so I created a waypoint uh, two miles past the airport called Richfield, Richfield Airport, so Richfield City. Uh, I forget what I called it, Richfield City Northeast or something. And I created it, and I put it in my nano just in case the next day it worked. It worked. Um, it wasn't easy. Uh, I made a big mistake, which I'll tell you about as we're going. So this is the SSA award application. So you put in all your personal data. You have to sign in and say, yep, I, this is all true. You have to circle the items that you're claiming. You can claim multiple flights. You do a diamond gold flight, 300K. You also get your gold distance of 300K. Um, and so on and so forth. You can do multiple in one flight. I'm going to just scan up here a little bit. So you put in the details. Is a motor glider in my case? Yes. The reason for that is I have to have an IGC flight recorder that can have sound. So if you hear a noise level that gets high, that means I started my engine. Um, so on and so forth. Tells you where you're at. Now these forms are terribly out of dated because you can't even use a barograph anymore. But you go, you have to put in barograph, GPS, etc. cetera. Um, and then the official observer has to sign this page as well. You have to sign this one, official observer does. Uh, I have this in PDF format, where with the exception of the circles and the signatures, you can fill it all in on your computer. Um, so that's the award application. Going back. Oh, where's my cursor? There's my cursor. So that's a diamond goal award application. Oops, sorry. Let me get the slideshow going. So uh, just for clarification, if, if we're looking for badge applications for silver and gold, right. we shouldn't be looking on the FAI website. We should be looking on the SSA website. The SSA has, has the forms, yes. Okay, thank you. But you really should be emailing me. Because Barry Yeager, uh, years ago, put it all into PDF format, yeah. so you can fill it in. Other, all you can do from the, from the SSA website is download a PDF form. Now, I think if you have Adobe Acrobat, you can probably fill it in. Okay, so. got it. Oh, sorry. So, let's take a look at a, what, a, what a badge and record worksheet looks like. looks real similar on the top. You've got to put all your data in. Um, again, some of these forms are so outdated that it's really hard to really explain. Um, recorder serial number and installation checked. That means you look in and say, yeah, are you carrying an ad or whatever. And aircraft continually observed until takeoff. That doesn't make sense, but Recorder sealed to the glider. That used to be where they put a seal on it. Well, we don't do that anymore. So you have to check one. Um, the nice thing about the IGC recorders is you can't fiddle with them. So if you have a valid IGC file, they're relatively accepted. Um, so what I did is, you can't see it here, but I wrote in the latitudes and longitudes. I have to sign, I guess, I'm sorry, the OO has to sign this one too, I apologize for that. And then there's a checklist that the OO has to go through and said, I performed and supervised the download and retained the original data file. <laughs> Nobody does that. Um, you're actually even allowed to rename the file to make it easier for Roland Hasness to deal with. Um, but the key is there's an integrity check, and he's going to pop it in to see you and do an integrity check, and it better come up okay. So do the integrity check <laughs> before you send it in. Um, and so on and so forth. Before you go any further, yes. just above that where it says pre-flight signatures, yes. notice that for the official observer, and it's pre-flight, the official observer should put the date and time and sign it before the flight. That's, that's what the form says. That's what the form says. Thank you for bringing that up. Does that have to be the same day of the flight? I mean, if you prepared the night so, before and the 00 saw it, and then you rolled out the next morning. Well, I believe what you're also certifying is that you've witnessed that the uh, flight recorder is in the glider and it hasn't been tampered with and so okay, forth. So sure. it, it should be the day of the flight. Got it. So, Thank so you. the other 
Can I, sorry. The, the, I, one of the things I've heard about this is that there's the, you know, the flight recorder can be interpreted as a declaration, right? Yes. And, yeah, yeah. and if you inadvertently set up the flight recorder wrong, and the declaration is after the signature on this, that can cause problems. Ah, hold that thought. Okay. I'm going to answer Dick's question first, and then hold okay. that thought because I, that's exactly one of the changes that happened this year. Okay. okay, so what happens in reality? What happens in reality is Daryl comes to me and said, Lou, will you be my official observer? You bet. What are you going to do? He tells me. And if it's a declared flight, he says, I'm going to go here to here to here to here. Great. And I look in his glider and I say, where's your flight recorder? Great, how are you doing that? Fine, go fly and then you backdate this. So, I mean, it's not that anybody's lying, it's just that you document, you, you document that you had the conversation after the fact. Simply because it's, it's easier. So, off-field landing, you do this if you're doing a downwind dash. Um, you don't have to have witness signatures anymore if you have an IGC flight recorder. Uh, the OO is theoretically supposed to know that you took off and landed. Um, the OO can rely on site records, so our foo sheets. You know, so if I'm, I, theoretically, I need to be here when you land if I'm going to be your official observer so I can look at your flight recorder. But once I see you take off with the flight recorder, that's really all I need to do because you can't tamper with it at that point. So um, there are some requirements where you have to confirm your release location. That's for distance. And then you have altitude. Now, here's one thing I'll point out. This is a mistake I made. I just thought I'll help you in the future. If you're flying in the mountains, I got in the mountains. I'm thermaling. I get up. It takes me a long time to get up. And I take three, four, five thermals. And finally, boom, I get to the magic, you know, I'm I'm at 14,000 feet, which lets me get away from the field. And now I have to fly back in the valley. And I start, and I go back to the rocks, and I get back up, and off I go. Great. I come back. I'm, I get within two miles of the field, and I'm, I'm thrilled. I've successfully flown this flight, and I realize I'm about to lose it because I'm at about 6,000 feet. Actually, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm about 9,000 feet. But it means I'm going to have lost too much altitude. So I ground around over the city of Parowan, a half a mile from the finish line, for 20 minutes, and I finally found a thermal and got up, and I, I didn't remember what I started at. Again, a mistake of mine. I couldn't remember what altitude I started at. Um, I figured 15,000 feet, I wasn't any higher than that, went out, finished the task. I mean, literally had to fly a half a mile, finished the task, and so then I didn't have to do an altitude calibration because I finished higher than I started going to get out of that and go back to the presentation. No, don't do that. Let's just go this way. Okay. So, the, some flights require a pre-flight declaration. The silver badge used to. It doesn't anymore for distance. Um, you can program it into your IGC recorder. This is a head fake. That's an OD. That is not an IGC recorder. It would need to be thicker. It would be an ODIGC. Or you can do it on paper. And on paper, paper overrules the flight recorder. Except this is new this year, diamond and diploma flights. If you're going to do a diamond distance, diamond goal, or a diploma flight, you have to have that pre-declared in your flight recorder. They no longer allow a paper declaration. in part because people weren't doing it right. Because a lot of the old assumption was to do a distance flight, you didn't have to pre-declare it. You could fly it and pick your points after the fact. And it turns out that was wrong. Good question on that. Sure. So let's say some of our hotshots here want to fly 500 clicks. Yes. Diamond distance. Yes. Do they have to declare where they're going to land on this declaration? Ah. Hold that thought. Yeah. I got that covered. Great. The answer is maybe. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. Uh, yeah. Did you okay. know that? Yeah. So, Do you know the answer to the question? No. Okay. Yeah. So we talked about flight recorders. They've got to be calibrated within five years or within two months after the flight. So you, if you 
you know, if you don't want to calibrate your flight recorder, just fly with it, do something special, take it to Paul, and within 60 days, he does it. And hope it's calibrated. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. There, there's, there's, That's I don't really change anything in the settings. I just created a table that says that this is what it reads, is what it actually is. There's really no changes to it. So. Right. But what I meant was that it didn't go out of calibration and mess up your flight. That's why you can do it two months after. No, but if it wasn't calibrated, say something went wrong with it, you do your flight, and and therefore, when it does get calibrated, they say, oh, you know, it was really doing point nine instead of one. Right. Distance. Oh, no, no. The calibration is for altitude only. I apologize. Thank you. But this is an altitude calibration. Yeah, so the, the risk is you thought you got an altitude, you didn't get an altitude right. after the calibration. But the, the new, as Paul was saying. Current loggers are pretty darn accurate. So yeah. You know, yeah. If you add 50 feet to everything you do, you're going to be fine. Yeah. And this is, this is one, this has always been the case. You can reuse more than one flight recorder. In the old days, you know, your barograph wouldn't work or something like that. So you can do more. But there's another requirement this year because of that. So silver badge, just going to briefly go through. It requires three elements. A silver altitude, which is a 1,000 meter gain from an in-flight low point to a high point. That can be four hours apart. But you've got to have a low point and a high point of 1,000 feet, 1,000 meters. Uh, silver duration. The iron butt. <laughs> so, Roy, how long was your five-hour endurance flight? Well, let me say that my uh, my Android phone that I was tracking my time with, no. the battery ran out. <laughs> <laughs> and it was 6 o'clock, and I thought, you know, I took off at 1, and then I had to get released, and I don't really know, and I'm like... 2,000 feet and away from the airport. Mm -hmm. So I just stretched it as long as I could and I landed and it came out to five hours, two minutes, and three seconds. <laughs> 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 I, I, I was the food that day and I wanted to go home. And this guy, Paul, he's up there and at the three and a half hour mark, he's the only guy in the air. And so we got everything put away and we're waiting and we're waiting. And then I realized. I know what he's doing. So I went to the food cart and said, what was his takeoff time? And I could see him going. There was a cloud street, and it was a few miles long. Four miles long, about four miles away. It, he's just it's going back and forth. <laughs> okay, I'll show you the trace. It's pretty, pretty It's like ridge flying, only up there. And, and, uh, and I got on the radio and said, you need to, he said, he said something about, what was my takeoff time? And I said, you need to stretch. You need to stretch. And he landed. We'd, we didn't know until I got home and we popped it in. So that was, that was good stuff. Um, silver distance. Uh, this is a 50. It used to be pre-declared. It's no longer pre-declared. It's now a 50-kilometer flight with less than 1% altitude loss. Um, I'm going to go into that in a little more detail because both things in here have changed a little bit. A little. Yes. Let me add on the altitude. You know, you could get released at, at 2,900 feet, drop down to 24, and then climb all the way back up. And right. that's, it, it doesn't matter what you got released at, just what your low point was for the flight. Yep. yep. Then this, by the way, silver, these are all very, very doable in Minnesota, right here out of Stanton. Yeah. Um, so, silver bad distance, this is the new part. And it, they did this in October 2018. It's a 50-kilometer straight line flight measured from both the point of release and the point of starting the takeoff roll. It's got to be 50 kilometers for at least one. Nay, it has to be 50 kilometers from both. From both. What it Correct. Says. Yeah. Yep. Um, so because what happened is here's your airport. People were towing way out here and then doing their 50K, so they flew right over the airport. And so what they're doing is saying, no, no, no. It's got to be 50K from the shorter of, of that. So how is the best way to handle the new rule? You're flying Stanton. You're going to go to Wasika. Just release northeast of the field because Wasika is 50 kilometers from your takeoff point. And if you're released northeast, that's your release point. you got to cover. If you're flying 
to Dodge Center, release north of the airport. If you're flying from Faribault to Dodge Center via Owatonna, release northwest of the field. And just by releasing up course, you've got it covered. If you released north and then overflew Stanton on your way to Dodge Center, from what I understand is it wouldn't qualify. It does. Yeah. Because, because, you're, you're, because your takeoff point is Stanton. Is right. not, Dodge Center is not your 50K. They both have. Just short. Yeah, you're, no, it's, it's 50K. It's 32.1 miles or something exactly. Dodge Center. If you take in the old days, if you take off from Stanton, land at Dodge Center, you got it. Which is, Roy, that's what you did, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you take off and land, that's enough distance. But I did go north to, to the lake and release. So right. Right. What, I, what you don't want to do is take off from Stanton, release south of the airport, and go to Dodge Center, because then you're short. Right. Yeah, you can't have the tow plane help you out. So special documentation requirements, if you're close to a thousand meter Dane, you got to do the altitude corrections for the calibration. That's easy. It's a spreadsheet. Let me back up a notch. You're releasing north of the airport, but you're overflying your start point. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter because you're in the air at that point in time. They both have to be longer than 50K. They both have to be longer than 50K. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. Um, duration, you're... You can't lose more than uh, 1,000 meters. Almost all the flights that have something to do with distance are also the same. Um, so just get off at 3,000 feet or less, and you've got no problems with that. Uh, distance. This is the one that gets people. So if you want to fly from here to Dodge Center, you take off, release at 3,000 feet, land, you've blown the, you're going to blow the 1% rule. And that's to keep people from taking a high tow and doing a 30-mile glide. So what you need to do is, if you hit the 50K mark, you need to hit, if you release at 3,000 feet, you've got to hit the 50K mark at 1,400 feet. If you don't do that, just keep going. Just keep going, find a thermal, get up, and then do whatever you want. But what you can't do is hit the 50K mark, then backtrack and find a thermal. You have to keep going um, to stretch that. Uh, and this is this is added this year. Uh, no team flying for silver distance. You got You got to go by yourself. Can I ask a, or make a statement here, and you can tell me if it's correct? The aim here is to force people to go cross country. Yes, you Not have to, to say launch at Stanton, get towed twenty miles away. Fly 40 miles in the other direction and land back at Stanton. Correct. There is a cross-country component to that flight. You might be out of gliding range of an airport, but what they want you to do apparently is to go someplace else. Yes. Is that a true statement? No. Okay. And they they want you to go someplace else. You can return, but they you they want you to have a f true 50 kilometer stretch. That's not. Uh, that doesn't have the safety of an airport at all times, your home airport at all times. Yes, right. Got it. That, that mean, makes sense? You mean near an airport, but you don't have, you can't, it has to be 50 kilometers from, from your airport. Your, right. Or the, where you're right. released from. Yeah. So, Lou, with, with them taking out the declaration component of it, basically they're saying navigation doesn't really matter. Right. Just go. Just go. And here's the, here's the other part about it. It also means you can inadvertently get your silver distance. Right. <laughs> well, I, I, I had a student actually do a 50K, but he was so far off course, I wouldn't give it to him. Yeah. <laughs> well, he really wanted to go one place, and I thought, you're not navigating. That's you got to know how to navigate. Yeah. Sooner or later, you've got to yeah. know how to navigate. Luke, one, one, one other thing you, you mentioned earlier, as long as you release it at 3,000 feet, and you're, you know, but that's, if I understand correctly, to go to Dodge Center. No, that was for duration. That was for duration, okay. Yeah. For, no, the 1% rule applies. You've got to release that over Stanton. Well, you'd... Go we'll to Dodge Center. 1,600 feet. Okay. But, but that's not the way to do it. I mean, the way to do it is release at whatever you need to, get up, go fly, and, and, and get to your destination high. 
or higher. You don't lose more than how many? 1,640 feet. So for a 50K, and it just the longer you fly, the more it adds. So if you fly, just a second, if you fly to Wasika, which is 36 miles, now you can get to Wasika at 1,200 feet or whatever the 1% is of 36 miles. You get the 1% rule, I'm almost certain, correct? Right. That's what applies. 1% of distance flown is the maximum amount of altitude permitted to be lost from A, the start, to B, the finish. I just it, it just threw me when he said you could release at 3,000. Okay. Yeah, got it. Thanks. So, um, if you have a flight recorder, yes, you can reach your destination higher, and your flight recorder proves it. Oh yeah. If you don't have a flight recorder and you just land at Dodge Center, then 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 it needs to be within the one percent rule because. That's the only way it can prove you weren't too high. If the total to to release, release is the only thing, if the total to release altitude is the only thing that right. shows the total release altitude at that point. Yeah, yeah. At that, that point in time, you're in steam gauges and yeah. and what have you. I mean, when Al flew his, um, he was low at a midpoint, but he got up really nicely. So when he got to Dot Center, you were high as a kite, mm -hmm. and then. Things went the other way when you started back, so you went back and landed. But the, but the, I think your, I think your, fifty when you hit the fifty k mark, it actually was higher than your release altitude. Good. Yeah, and um, one other interesting thing is, let's say you do a seventy kilometer flight, you can pick your start and ending based on altitude. It just has to be some 50K block. So uh, I, I did one where I had to shorten my claim. I had like 325 kilometers flown, but I had to shorten my claim because I was on final glide and I broke through the, the thousand meter mark, but I was able to back it up to 500 and, or 306 kilometers or something like that. So I, I, I flew with Barry one time, and we were doing that, and we came in, and he and it usually says task is over, but it didn't say task was over, and he thought, what's going on here? It's not telling me what it normally says. It's not saying the task is over. Well, what he came out to find out later is that he broke that that rule, and the, the computer said. This, the task is not over because you broke that rule. He didn't know it at the time. I certainly didn't know it at the time. No. But if he would have said, oh, okay, went back, got a thermal, and then did it again, if we could have found one, then, it, then the task would have been over. Right. There is actually an option in the OD and some of the flight recorders that you can say, I want my finish line to be 1,000 meters below my start line, mm -hmm. my start altitude. Um, I don't ever use that because it doesn't take into account safety altitude. For landing. Anyway. Bill Little, can I, can I mention one more thing? Sure. So when we, I guess maybe a rule of thumb is, especially on a blue day, if you're doing your your uh, silver, is is to don't release too high, even if you expect you're going to be higher when you get to Dodge Center. You know, don't release above that limit, that 1% that rule, because if you have to land at Dodge Center, you know, you're gone to, you know, and you have a final glide and you land there, you're still going to, it's still going to work. But if you happen to get good thermals and you arrive higher, then that's fine, too. Yeah. I, th I think for, for where should you release on your silver, if you're trying for silver distance, release any th time, I, I never release below 2,000 feet. I'm not going to be a hero. I know guys release at 1,600 and climb up. I don't do that. Any time over 2,000 feet, I get a thermal, I release and climb up. That's, that's my, my guideline. Moving on to the gold. So, two required elements for gold, a gold altitude, which is a 3,000 meter climb. That's pretty tough to do in Minnesota. Um, I think it's been done before, but it's pretty tough. Um, a distance, you got to do a 300 kilometer cross-country flight. And the, uh, if you haven't completed your five hour for silver, you have to do that as well to get the gold badge. Um, gold distance is 300 kilometers. You will hear the terms distance and goal. Distance is 
fly anywhere. Goal is land where you take off. That's the only difference between these no, two. Not where you take off, where you declare. Correct? Well, I, I'm sorry. I'm assuming most people take, take a start where they take off. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So gold altitude, that will require an altitude calibration. Again, a simple spreadsheet. You put down, here's, here's the actual reading from my flight recorder. Here's the calibration. You figure out the differences in altitude, and then you do an extrapolation to come up with your uh, true altitude, if you will. Okay, goal distance requires a start, finish, zero to three turn points. What's a zero turn point flight? Downwind. Downwind dash. Yep. Uh, downwind dash. Great. Out return. And a polygon. So I'm planning for diamond. I need to do a 500 kilometer flight. And I found out that if you fly from Stanton to just slightly north of Blue Earth, you are, uh, and back to Stanton, and back to Blue Earth, and back to Stanton, that's an out and return twice, but it's a start at Stanton, turn point one Blue Earth, turn point two Stanton, turn point three Blue Earth, finish Stanton. That's a totally legal 500k flight. Did you mean Albert Lee or did you mean Blue Earth? Blue Earth. Okay. What did I say? If I said Albert Lee, I was... No, you said Blue Earth. Okay, I, Blue Earth. I thought you meant Blue yep. Earth, Albert Lee. Yep. And the reason I set that up is you're never more than about 14 miles from an airport. So, um, it does not need to be a closed course, meaning you don't have to have a start and finish point that's the same. Maximum 1,000 meters altitude loss, again, just release below 3,000 feet, you're good. 3,200 feet, actually. And for all but a downwind dash, downwind dashes do never have to be pre-declared for anything. Not for the diplomas, nothing. Downwind dashes never require a pre-declaration. For a goal distance, you can de pre-declare your flight either in your flight recorder or on paper. Paper overrules flight recorder. As long as your official observer is in the loop and agrees that's what you said you were going to do, that's fine. And you have to do it on the ground, of course. You can't do it in the air. Diamond badge. Okay, three things. Altitude, 5,000 meters. Dick. How do you get diamond altitude? You go to wave camp at Minden. <laughs> <laughs> and is that easy? <laughs> On the right day, and if you know what you're doing. <laughs> but, well, I, I went to wave camp two years ago, and uh, I went a couple of days early. I was explaining to a couple of people today that it, I did took care of some of the the requirements to, to fly a rented glider ahead of time before the camp actually started. And that put me in good position because I think there was at least 30 pilots there. Only a handful had their own glider. So I wanted to be near the front of the queue to use a rented plane so I could attempt my uh, diamond altitude. And uh, then it's a matter of being at, at the right place at the right time on the right day. And uh, uh, my, my whole flight was 61 minutes from takeoff to landing. I released at some, I think about 10,800 feet, I think, I don't remember exactly, and I was climbing at close to 2,000 feet per minute initially, and it kind of tapered off and got up to 27 and a, about 27 and a half. The ceiling uh, in the weight box was uh, 28,000, and so I had, and all I, the only indicator I had was these, this old altimeter in this old discus, and I wasn't sure how much I could trust you know, it's reading at 27,500 feet, but I knew if I went over 28,000, there's no diamond. And if I didn't quite make it, of course, I wouldn't get it. So it was, it was interesting. I learned a lot. And I worked with Dick to do the altitude calibration because after we got done with the calibration, how many feet did you clear it by? Well, I think it was at least 200 feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, yeah, the, the, this is where that altitude calibration is required. Uh, a diamond goal, and this is where you've got to do a closed court course. It's either an outer return or a triangle. Those are your only two choices. Um, and uh, diamond goal, if you get your diamond goal, you also get your goal distance. 
So if you so if you fly a 300k declared triangle, um, you're you're good to go. Um, out of stand the the bread and butter. Uh, 300k triangle is Stan, Blue Earth, Austin, and home. Uh, you can also go Austin, Houston, Stefan. Why well, don't? Yeah, it's Houston and home. Um, but uh, there, that the goal is pretty good uh, to be able to done right out of Stan. Diamond distance is is 500 kilometers. That's a little harder. But there's been a number of 500 kilometer flights in Minnesota. What's Dick, what's the last 500 kilometer flight that you know of that was flown in Minnesota? <laughs> it was an out and return. It was an out and return with? Barry Yeager in the Arctic. About this time last year. Uh, it was April 25th, I okay. believe. Okay. I looked that up last night. There we go. So, uh, we talked about the calibration it's going to require, diamond goal, it's out and return, start and finish, must be the same. Must be pre-declared in your IGC flight recorders. Read that last one. There's no paper allowed anymore. Diamonds must be declared in your flight recorders. Okay, diamond distance. And again, downwind dash never requires a pre-declaration. Pre okay, so what's after diamonds? 750 kilometer distance, 1,000 kilometer distance, 2,000. There's Lenny pins. Dick got a Lenny pin. What's a required for, requirement for a Lenny pin? I think it's a gain of 20,000 feet or something like that. And they, they go reaching 25,000, yes, sorry. Yeah. It's reaching 25,000 and then it goes up from there. Um, these are interesting because a lot of people do these on the ridge. Uh, and they pre-declare. All these need to be pre-declared and all these need to be pre-declared in your flight recorder now. Diamonds and above, um, but uh, except for a downwind dash, and I did some work last winter, and I think a 750 kilometer out of Minnesota has never been done. Brian will be here tomorrow. Brian holds the record for the longest flight out of uh, Minnesota. He flew from Sleepy Eye to just outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and Jim Hard actually owns the longest handicap distance, f downwind dash. What's that? Right went to St. Louis. Oh, sorry. Yeah. St. Louis, sorry. All right. So, key changes, just a reminder. They added the point of takeoff roll to the silver distance calculation. So, you got to do two calculations. They required a declaration in your flight recorder for diamond gold, diamond distance, and de any diploma distance. If you use more than one flight recorder, this is important too. This is no longer allowed, by the way. Barographs are no longer allowed. Um, if, and, and fiddling with your nano is not allowed either. <laughs> uh, if you use one, more than one flight recorder, the official observer must look at them both. Hey, Dick, I've got a farm and I've got a nano. Great. And the declarations, all of them have to be submitted, and they all have to be identical. Yes? Why would you submit two if one was good? I don't know. You could put a declaration I, I, in one. That, well, that's, that's, that's I think that's the issue they were trying to, I don't know what the IGC was trying to address. I but get I the idea of redundancy in flight in case one checks out. But right. If both work, either right. one should do to submit. Is that correct? No. Not according to the new rules. Is that right? Yes. Well, they don't want you to declare a 300 kilometer that way and a 300 kilometer that way and then get up there and see which one works the best uh, and then submit that. They want you to, they want you to yeah. actually declare what you're going to fly but um, okay, I, I get it. But I'll, I will say to the not to you, but to the FAI, it is vastly easier to fly these flights than it is to document them. It <laughs> 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 shouldn't be that high. I disagree, Bob. I think it's much easier to do an electronic declaration in an OD than, or in a nano than it is to do it on a piece of paper. Yeah, That's I easy. agree with you. I agree with you there. But still, the rules are extremely complicated for me, at least, to interpret. But yeah, electronic is the way to right. go. I get that. It's very easy to. Mess it up. Okay. Yeah. Now, then, so, so the other thing is, let me go back to Rollin Hassens. Rollin's a good guy. If he has a problem with your submission, he's going to get back to you and say, I don't get this. Okay, so I did my gold distance, um, the 300K, at the, at the contest in Albert Lee. This was under the old assumed rules 
uh, which have now been clarified. So I went and picked my points. Well, I did not realize that I could click on a point and it would give me my GPS coordinates in the lower right-hand column of CU. So I was moving my cursor, and the cursor was, and I was reading the coordinates from that, and they weren't right. I just, whatever I was doing was wrong. And so I sent this all in, and he got back to me and said, basically, WTF, you know, <laughs> what are you doing? And I said, oh, and then I got a hold of Paul, and I said, Paul, what am I doing wrong? And Paul fixed it, and I got back to him, and he said, I get your flight. Yeah, I can see where you went, but your declaration does not match. And then he let me, he let me just withdraw and submit a new one. No, no issues, no problems. So, Lou. Yes. My flight recorder, you know, it's, it's uh, I whatever, I G C flight recorder. Right. But so is my Vario. Mm -hmm. Okay, flight recorder because I know it goes to the uh, <coughs> Vario 2 because it's the cross-country one for ClearNav. So does that declare it on both of them at the same time, or do you have to do it separately? Or how does that get to where you have the two? Well, theoretically, the FAI is saying that you should declare it in both your ClearNav color display and in your ClearNav variometer, and you should submit both of those flight logs at the end of the day. However, not many people can do that in their gliders because they're complicated devices. Yep. I would suggest that you show the OO, I'm declaring in my clear now color display and I'm going to go fly my flight and I'm going to give you the flight out of that. Don't mention the Vario. Yeah. Okay. If you ask about it, you say, I didn't declare it in that. You can have the flight log, but it's not declared. But I didn't declare something else. You know, I, okay, I was just asking. I think most of the official observers would be like, okay, cool. That's where yeah. I saw you declare it. It's good. You know, I, that's what my, my take on it. Because yeah, they talk to each other, and I didn't know if they would declare, if no. one would declare to the other one or not. Yeah. No. In that case, they do not. You drive the declaration. You, you say to the official observer, I totally agree with what yeah. Paul said. Okay. Can I ask Paul another yeah. question? Sure. Uh, I heard what you said very clearly about they don't want you to have multiple declarations, like task A to the west and task B to the east. Mm -hmm. But why not? They're equally difficult to follow. E they each fit the rules, right, if you do it right. They're so why not allow the pilot to decide? They're not pre-flight pre declarations. Declaration. <laughs> <Say again? laughs> they're not pre-flight declarations. No, I'm saying they are. They're, I'm saying they are, but they're not identical. One is, let's say, east of Stanton, and the other one is west. Why, why are they prejudiced against that? I, I don't have a strong opinion either way about it. Okay. I, I don't I understand. understand. I'm not saying, blaming you. I understand what you're saying, but yeah. I understand what they're saying. <laughs> Okay. I, I think what it does is, it, for a person who has two flight recorders, it may give them an advantage yeah. that they get to choose once they're up in the air or after they land, whatever. They can yeah. choose okay. the one that worked right. out better. I get Whereas I me, I can only afford, I can barely afford one. You that know? makes sense. Mm -hmm. well, Just to two. clarify, you don't yeah, need to have exactly more right. than one. No, no, no. no. Flight no. They know that you have yes. the the discipline. Discipline. Oh. If you so didn't. in the old days when you had paper, you couldn't put three that's sheets of paper in front of the, the old That's where the O comes in. That's where the official observer comes in. So you're good point. Okay, thanks. You had to photograph it. Yeah. With the wingtip in the view. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, for two seaters, there is one minor change. <clears throat> is you got to declare the co-pilot. This is Dick and I when we fly. It's like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and their are you, birthday. Are you awake, back? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first, the first, Dick is very generous with, with his glider. The, one of the very first times I was flying with him, I mean, I was still a student, and I'm flying, and he goes, I, I'm going to take a nap. You just fly. <laughs> so, Lou, for something like that, with a two-seater, you don't have to have a co-pilot. No, nope, you don't. That is, that is nope. considered just a single-seater? Yes. Yes. Yeah, with high performance. Uh, okay, so one less thing to worry about, and if you're old enough, you'll get that. Alfred. <laughs> so, the goal, goal distance, these all require an altitude loss of 1,000 meters. Okay? I'm sorry, no more than. So, the easy way to do that is tow slightly up course of your starting point. Release no higher than 3,200 feet AGL. 
Take a full circle. Make sure you get a good, good circle so they know when you're released. Fly to and cross the start line. Unless you're working on a speed record, we don't care how long you take. We just care what you do. So cross the line. You're at 3,000 feet. It's, it's better be a booming day, right? Because you, otherwise you wouldn't try a big flight. Now look for your first thermal. You got 3,000 feet. You know, you get off at 3,000, 3,200, you cross the finish line, it's cross the start line, boom, your flight recorder notches that you've got a valid start, and now look for your first thermal. Mm -hmm. Then you don't ever have to worry about, if you're doing a squeaky final glide, you don't have to worry about rolling past the midpoint of the airport and missing your claim by 30 yards. <laughs> so, without, without, without twisting that, you, when they say it's closed course, make sure you cross the finish line. And if you're coming in on a final glide, I mean, Stefan came in, he had this beautiful 300K triangle. He did it in a day when you couldn't see because of smoke. He, he couldn't see much, so he followed 52 all the way up from Houston or whatever it is, Rushford, and, and got here with plenty of altitude and never crossed the finish line. So he landed, and he had, had he rolled, and being a great pilot, he stopped short of the cross runway. The finish line was on the cross runway, and even with appeals and Brian's support, was, it was like 30 feet or something. 30 feet. 30 feet. 300K <laughs> triangle lost by 30 feet. Okay, any questions?